So as a young man, I was about 24, I wasn't happy with how my life was going. And so I started to seek some help for it, not from anybody, but what I did was I just started to read. And I started to read three texts. This is my Book of Mormon, which I've had for 20 something years. This is my Quran, which I've had for the same number of time. And this is my Bible. So I began reading all of these books back then. And the reason I began reading all of these books because, um, you know, we live in a world now where with regard to religion, even with regard to how you live your life outside of religion, we have a buffet of things to choose from. There's a number of things we can read. Self-help books. Um, these aren't the only books that claim to be revelation from God, but there's a number of them. And so I began to read to find out how I could change my life, how I could do things differently. Now, I, I read the Book of Mormon for a while until I read some verses that made me feel like this book was not for me. And here's what I'm going to read for you. This is from Nephi. It's a book of Nephi. And here's what it says. And he, God, had caused the cursing to come upon them, yea, even a sore cursing because of their iniquity. For behold, they had hardened their hearts against him, that they had become like, like unto a flint. Wherefore, as they were white and exceedingly fair and delightsome, that they might not be enticing unto my people the Lord, God did cause their skin of blackness to come upon them. So the curse was dark skin. And there's a number of times where, it, where this appears in this book. So quickly I put this book down because I said, this can't be talking about me because my skin right now is fairly dark, which means I'm part of a curse. And there are a number of other things in there as well. But here's the thing. If something is going to change my life, I wanted it to be truth. Now, we live in a world now where truth is optional, and everybody lives by their opinion. And whatever they decide is their truth becomes their truth, even if it's not true. I had a discussion with a, a young lady who told me things like this. She gets all of her stuff, and things come from her, and it comes from the universe. So I said to her, you've heard this, right, the universe. So I said to her, the universe is an inanimate object. You know, that's like saying that this rock or whatever gave me something. It has no capacity to think. It has no capacity. So please explain to me how the universe makes things happen in your life. And she couldn't, but that is her truth. So it's not even about truth anymore. It's about opinion, what feels good to me. This is what I will live by, even if, I, even if it can be proven to be untrue. And here's the scary thing. The scary thing is now we've gotten to a point where every opinion is equal. Right? So, so we have 7 billion people in the earth, and suppose every single one of us had a different opinion on something. We don't go and look and find out what's true. We just say, well, if that's what you believe, that's fine. If that's what you believe, that's fine. That means we'd have 7 billion opinions. And here's what I believe. I don't believe truth is something we, are, we, we, um, we, we get from inside of our individual selves, but truth is something that exists, and it should always exist. For instance... What is one in plus one? Is that true? Right? Now, if I feel like it's not true, can I say, look, for me, one plus one is four, and then, and then all of you will say, well, you know, you know, you believe that. We don't believe it, but that's fine for you. What it would mean was I would be believing something that is not true. Right? And so what we're going to do over the next two weeks, and, I, I, and initially I wasn't too excited about this, but now I'm really excited because I like to teach stuff that has affected me. I don't like to teach, like, you know, knowledge. And, but but the, the stuff that we're going to look at today has really excited me now because the object of, of the next two weeks is for us to leave her realizing what we have in our hands, realizing what God has given us, Realizing what it is and how we can rely on it and depend on it. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to watch a four-minute video so that you guys would understand something. So we don't have any original copies, um, um, any original writings of the Bible. And that's, the true with mo that's true with most history, Shakespeare, everything. We don't have originals. We have copies, right? And so historians and bibliographers use certain tests to demonstrate whether or not something is a real good copy of something uh, of the original, Right? 
And I want you to understand that above all other copies, above all other historical documents, the copies of the Bible exceed every single other document by far. It's not even close. Watch this. How do you know that you can trust the New Testament as being reliable? After all, it's a pretty big book. In fact, it's 27 books. Well, let me give you three quick tests about how historians judge any ancient book, and we'll see how the New Testament fares. The first one, we just ask the question, does it claim to be true? It's called the internal evidence test. When you look at the New Testament writers, it's remarkable about how many times they go out of their way to tell us that truth is important. So Luke, who's a medical doctor, begins his gospel by saying, many have undertaken to examine the events among us, but I have carefully recorded truth and in passing on to you, Theophilus, essentially what I know to be true. Second Peter 1.16, Peter says, we're not following club invented tales, we were eyewitnesses. And in 1 John, the author says, what we have seen, what we have heard, what we've touched with our hands, we proclaim to you. So the biblical writers claim to be eyewitnesses. They claim to have carefully reported truth. And then what's amazing is, as we know from the apostles, they were willing to suffer and willing to die for their belief that this story was true. And they were eyewitnesses of the risen Jesus. That tells me that they really believed that it was true. Now, the second question is, you've heard of the telephone game, how word is passed from one person to the next over time. Well, what about the Bible that's been passed for 2,000 years? Well, scholars have what's called the bibliographical test, where we simply look at how many manuscripts do we have and how early are those manuscripts. The more manuscripts we have, the earlier they are, the better chance we have of reconstructing the original. Well, friends, for many ancient documents, manuscripts are 300 to 500, 1,000 years plus removed. For the New Testament, we have a portion of the Gospel of John at least within 40 or 50 years. The copies of the New Testament are way earlier than any other ancient books that people don't even question. But then the other question is, how many copies do we have? The more copies we have, the better chance of getting the original. Well, for a lot of ancient documents, we have 10, 12, 50, maybe a couple hundred. For the New Testament, we have over 23,000 handwritten copies. This gives us confidence when we compare the copies that we can reconstruct what was originally written down. Number three, what we call the external evidence test. Is there evidence outside of the book that supports the internal claims? And this is where archaeology and ancient writings come in. You know there's writings outside the Bible that confirm that Jesus claimed to be God, at least that Christians believed that he was God. There's writings that confirm his life, that he purportedly did miracles, where he lived, and that he died. We find this in people like Josephus and Tacitus. And then the archaeological record supports the New Testament as a whole. We know where Jesus was born. We know where Jesus died. In fact, we have the ossuary of Caiaphas, one of the high priests who oversaw the condemnation and ultimately led to the trial and death of Jesus. But now we actually have an inscription from Caesarea pointing to Pontius Pilate, who's the Roman governor who oversaw the trial and condemned Jesus to death. In fact, we have the crucified remains of a man named Yehohanan, who was crucified with nails around the time that Jesus lived, showing the biblical account about crucifixion with nails is correct. Friends, a lot of questions can be raised about the New Testament, but when we look at it broadly speaking, the authors claim to be eyewitnesses, we see accurate information they report, and they will only die for it. We see many more manuscripts earlier than any other ancient book. And third, the archeological record supports it. We have good reason to believe that the New Testament is reliable and true. Amen. Now, next week is going to be exciting because we're going to be looking at the external proofs, which is archaeology and the Bible and history and how accurate it is. And we're also going to be look, comparing it to some of these other books. Now, my goal is not to discredit the other books. I don't have any uh, desire to do that. But my goal is for us to arrive at truth. What do we hold in our hands? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 to 17 say this, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. We have to understand um, why 
that, that God has given us something which he actually says is his word. It said it is God breathed. He has breathed his breath into it. We have to understand that we are not holding a book that is just written by man, but inspired by God. And if we understand that it is inspired by God, then we have to begin treating it like it is inspired by God. We have to be, begin listening to it like, like it's inspired by God. We have to begin living it as if it is inspired by God. Now, why is it so important for us to have a confidence that this is truth. Well, because the Bible and some of these other books answer questions like this. Do we exist after death? If yes, what can we expect? How do we interpret our joys and sorrows right now on this earth? How can we be reconciled to God and how should we treat each other? All of these things are in Scripture. So every single, and that's what it says, it says it's useful for every single thing that we encounter in our lives. So we need to, need to have in our minds that this is truth. Because if we don't think it's truth, why in the world would we begin to use it for all of these significant decisions that we have to take, for all of these things that we have to do, and trust it for what it says about eternity? Here's the other thing that we have in our hands. Isaiah 48 says this, the grass visits and the flower falls, but the word of God endures forever. Do you know what this, what's true about this book? It endures forever. There will be a never a time where this book is irrelevant. So here's a question we're looking at. How, has God left us a trustworthy revelation that tells us how to be reconciled to him? And if so, what is it? And if so, what is it? We have to understand this. Truth, by definition, is exclusive. Now, see, some people will tell you what you do is you get some truth from here, you get some truth from here, you get some truth from here, and that's how you live your life, you know? You look at it because the Book of Mormon has some truth in it, the Quran has some truth in it, this thing has some truth in it. So you get all of these things from all these different religions, and then that's how you determine how you, how you live your life. But here's a problem with this. And, and people say, when we say, you know how Jesus said there's only one way to God and that is through him? People will say, oh, that's arrogant. Oh, that's crazy. That's exclusive. But truth by definition is exclusive. And therefore, the fact that people say that it is exclusive is not a reason to back down from it. Every single truth is exclusive. All right, see this carpet? What color is it? Well, I think it's maroon. So your truth is different from mine here. All right, I need something. Okay, Lisa, Lisa, stand up for me. What color is Lisa's shirt? We can all agree on this. Red. Right? Now, do you know what we've just done? We've just excluded every single other color that ever existed. Why? Because it's true. And there are other people who say to me, well, you know what? I think there are many ways to God. And they say, oh, that's so exclusive. But if you say there are many ways to God, you know what you've done? You've just excluded me because I don't believe there's many ways from God. So even their truth is exclusive, although they say it's, it encompasses everybody. It doesn't. Because if they say there are many ways to God and I believe there's only one, they've just excluded me. Every single person's truth is exclusive. That's the nature of truth. Christianity is not exclusive. Truth is exclusive. And if the truth is there is only one way to God, and we back down and go, oh, you know what? That doesn't seem exclusive. We are then not giving the truth to people, which means we're allowing them to live a lie or an error. So when somebody says to you, oh, your Christianity thing is so exclusive, just say to them, that's the nature of truth. Truth is exclusive. All right? Now, why do we need to to um, get to a point where we understand that what we have is truth. And here's two reasons why I believe. One, finite humans are incapable of discover discovering more absolutes on their own. Here's what I mean by this. We can't come to an objective ethical standard on our own. Can you imagine if what we said was, we are going to take every nation, leaders from every nation, bring them together, and then we're going to put them all together in a room, and then they're going to come up with truth for the whole world. Do you know how long that would take? They're going to come up with a moral and ethical standard for the whole world. Do you know how long it would take? 
It would take forever because they would never arrive at, at an objective standard. And even if they did, you know what would happen? When they came back to Bermuda, Bermuda and other countries and tried to apply it, the people would go, I don't, I'm not, I don't think that's right. So we can't come to an objective ethical or moral standard because of our influences. We think things are ethical and moral, where in other cultures they will think they're not. This is why we need a revelation from God which tells us what is true, what is moral, what is ethical. The second one is because we didn't create life, we can't find the correct answers to life's questions. Listen, how long has humankind been around? I don't know, so you have to answer or else we can't move forward. How long has humankind been around? Whatever he said, okay? Do you realize that people are still asking what is the purpose of life? Thousands of years and we still haven't figured it out. There are a bunch of people um, still walking around the earth trying to figure out what's the purpose of life. And what they've come up with is a nothing, nothingness philosophy which says there is no God, which then means how do you come up with the purpose of life? Which means that every single thing that we will ever experience will be done in the 70 or so years we live on this earth, which means then think about that. If, if this earth is the only life I'm ever going to live, why would I want to be ethical? Why would I want to be moral? You know what I want to do? I'd want to steal from all of you to have everything that you have so I can have it, right? So that I can enjoy myself while I'm on this earth. Like I would, I would, I would probably, no, no one repeat this. I would probably, right, if I came to the conclusion right now that this earth was it, I would probably leave my wife and daughter and just travel the world having fun. It's such an empty philosophy. Like, this is it. This is all we're going to experience. That's it. That means, why would I even decide to be ethical? Why would I decide to be moral? How many of you have been good, have done the right thing, and then not got the reward you deserve, but actually sometimes got the opposite? So if this earth was it, why would I continue doing the right thing? Because we live in a world where people don't even appreciate the right thing anymore. Right? So, we didn't create life. And we are never, ever going to get to a place where we have all of the questions of life understood, where we have all of the questions um, of, of eternity understood. We're never going to get to that place. That's why we need a revelation of God, so that we can have a better understanding of this life and the life after. Now, we're going to look at the uniqueness of the Bible in three areas, okay? And there is a lot, more, a lot more areas than this that the Bible is unique. A lot more, right? But we're going to look at it in three today. Human authors, the I, can't just, I just can't get this word out. It's very specific. And the accuracy of prophecy. And this one blows my mind. Okay? And then the final one, the uniqueness of Jesus. I think we get so used to Jesus, we don't understand how unique he is with regard to religious experience. There is nothing like him in any other religion. There is nothing. Every other religion makes everything about you. And this one says everything is about him. He is so unique. And when you understand how unique he is, you have to come to the conclusion that this whole thing about Jesus came from the mind of God and not from a mind of man. Every other religion makes sense to me. It says you work hard, you do everything you can, and at the end of your life, God will go, oh, you did this many good things, this many bad things, and you therefore get a reward. That makes sense to me because that's how we operate. But God comes and says, it's not even about you. I'm going to be the one who, who sends a sacrifice. I'm going to be the one who secures your salvation. That makes no sense to the human mind. That's not how we operate. That's how God operates. And the uniqueness of Jesus just blows my mind as well. All right. So, human authors. So the Book of Mormon was written by a man named Joseph Smith. And he was born in December 1805. Now, realize this, that before the Book of Mormon was written, there was no Book of Mormon, right? Which means that nobody before the Book of Mormon had any of this information. 
So if this thing is supposed to lead you to salvation, everybody before this is messed up. He was visited by angels who directed him to buried golden plates, who, by the way, no one has ever seen besides him. And he had some glass, some special glasses. Um, and the Book of Mormon is a translation of these golden plates. So that's how the Book of Mormon came to be, right? The Quran was written by a man named Muhammad, and he was visited by an, the archangel Gabriel, and the text was, the revealed, was revealed to Muhammad from the archangel Gabriel. Now, it is important that we understand that the revelation that came to these two men, where both of them, they say it came from an angel, but here's the thing. This revelation was only given to one person, and only one person can verify what they heard, what they saw. There is nobody, no other writings outside of their writings which suggests that um, somebody else was visited by the angel and confirms their revelation. Now let's look at the human authors of the Bible. I want you to understand how God takes diversity and people from all over the place, from different circumstances, and from it brings unity in a book that just boggles the mind. The human authors of the Bible, approximately 35 to 40 men, depending on who you believe, wrote certain books like Acts, written over a period of 1,500 years. Listen, these guys didn't get together and sit down and collude and say, here's what we want to see in this book. Most of these guys never met one another. They never met. They lived in different circumstances, different countries. One is a fisherman. One is a tax collector. One, they're, they're all so different. There is nothing about them that suggests that they would have the same thoughts, the same ideology, the same theology. Nothing. Nothing. Listen, me and my brother were born in the same house. We were raised in the same house. Do you know how many varying opinions we have? I know twins who can't agree on a lot of things. And here we have men from all over the place, over 1,500 years, different cultures, influence, and circumstances, and in different countries, three languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. And then there's unbelievable unity from diversity. How do you get a Jew to agree with a tax collector? And how do you get... Uh, uh, somebody, who is, <clears throat> somebody who is high up in society to agree with somebody who's way down here to the point where they're all willing to sacrifice everything for it. It makes no sense. Now, there are a couple of ways in which we want to look at the unity of the Bible. First of all, the unity of theme. Okay? We're going to look at John chapter 5, verse 39. John chapter 5. Verse 39, this is Jesus talking to the Jews. And here's what he says. This is re regard to the theme of the Bible. He says to the Jews, you study the scriptures differently because you think that in them you have eternal life. He says this, these are the very scriptures that testify about me. And then in verse 46, he says this, if you believed Moses... You will believe me, for he wrote about me. Do you realize from Genesis to Revelation, the theme of the Bible is the reconciliation that God offers through his son, Jesus Christ? And the, the awesome thing about it is, the guys in the Old Testament who wrote about the coming of Jesus never experienced it, but wrote about the same thing that New Testament believers who saw Jesus wrote about. It just blows my mind. How could... It'd be so united in theme. It's united in structure. Here's what this means. Though the Bible is 66 books written by 40 men, you put it all together and it is cohesively one. It's one. Now, can I tell you something? If there was another book written on any subject by men that long ago and that many men and it was still relevant today and, and, it, was, and it was this united, we would all marvel over it. Say it was written on Madison, right? And, and let's say they wrote it. And it's 40 different guys from way back then. We pick it up today, we read it, and we go, man, this thing's relevant today. Even, even though all of the technological changes, it's still relevant. And look how these guys never met each other. They were from all over the place. And, and look how united this thing is. We would all go, man, how did that happen? How did this happen? God. And then the unity of symbolism. All through the Bible, you will see things like 
symbols used for leaven, symbols used for the Holy Spirit. You'll see the symbol, symbols in Leviticus and Hebrews that link those two books together in Daniel and Revelation and how they all come together so beautiful. The, body, the Bible is a unified book, but it comes from complete and utter diversity. Now, my favorite, the uniqueness of Bible prophecy. It is specific, it's accurate, Now listen, if you make an ambiguous prediction, it's pretty easy to make it fit somewhere, right? Like one time, this guy came to me, this was a long time ago, and he said he went to like this Christian, it's almost like a Christian fortune teller, and he had a CD of it, and he put it in, and in the background there was this music playing, Ooh, you know, and I said, were there candles in it? He was like, yeah. I'm like, what is going on here? So then... The woman's saying this, look, you will have trouble, but the Bible told us we'll have trouble, right? Right? Then he said, she said, and it will be from someone close to you. So now he's having problems with his wife and he's saying, see, see, see. See how right she was? <clears throat> now if I say to you, you're going to have trouble, I haven't told you anything. And if I tell you, you're going to have trouble with somebody close to you. I haven't told you anything. Therefore, if it's your cousin, your boss, your whatever, whenever it happens, you go, see, see, see. That's not how Bible prophecy op operates. The Bible names people. It names uh, places. It names exactly what is going to happen to a degree that's just unbelievable. There was a, now, as far as specific prophecy goes, there was, it was reported that somebody made a prediction with regard to Princess Diana about a week before she died. And the prediction was that she would marry Dodi Alfie, whatever, Alfie Ed, whatever that guy was named, right? And again, that's not a humongous prediction because I thought they were moving that way anyway, right? But then Princess Diana died, and so it not, never happened. Now, here's the danger of specific predictions. You can then walk into that woman and say, listen, you said this was going to happen because this can't relate to any other event, right? You said she was going to marry him. It ain't going to happen now. You were wrong. Right? And here's how God operates in prophecy. He puts prophecies out there where you can't make them fit to anything else. And if they don't happen, you can come back and say the Bible was wrong. But here's what we can expect from God. If the prophecy is coming from God, we can expect that God will speak with the same clarity about the future that historians speak about the past or you even write in your journal about what happened today because God has been there. And if he doesn't speak specifically and accurately about it, then something is wrong. And with regard to the Quran and with regard to um, the Book of Mormon, there's a lot of prophecies that Joseph Smith made that people are, that clearly didn't come true. Um, but the, the, the Latter-day Saints will say things like, oh, it was misinterpreted, or they have all of these excuses for it. With the Quran, he has a lot of uh, ambiguous things, like with regard to AIDS, the coming of AIDS. It doesn't say AIDS. It's kind of like, they all sound kind of like this. Anybody remember a guy called Nostradamus who everybody freaks out over? Okay. This is one of his. The great man shall be struck down in the day by a thunderbolt. The evil deed predicted by the bearer of a petition According to the prediction, another falls at nighttime, conflict in rains, London, and the pestilence of Tuscany. Somebody tell me what that predicted. This is how the man's predictions go. Now, there are some, like one, one about the fire of London, that is pretty accurate, right? And it has pretty specific stuff in it. But most of them sound like this. But let me tell you what his followers say this predicted. The death of President Kennedy. Right, that's what I said. What? It doesn't mention his name. It doesn't mention anything. Now let's look at Bible prophecy. Let's look at Bible prophecy, right? First, from Ezekiel 26. You're going to get to read this in your small groups. But this is Ezekiel 26, a specific prophecy towards a city called Tyre. At the time, if you, read, if you go and, and search Tyre, you'll see that Tyre was a significant city. It's mentioned all through the Old Testament and the New Testament. It was a... a um, it was a powerful city with regard to economics. It, it's described as a fortress. Like, it is a very significant city. And the thing is, back in that day, we're talking about empire building. And empire building is where when um, somebody takes over, they don't just take over their place, they take over the whole place. 
right? Like Alexander the Great. It wasn't good enough for him just to conquer, to be the leader of his country. He then went and conquered other countries because these guys were in empire building. And so Tyre would have been a threat to anybody who was trying to build an empire. Look, look at what it says. For this is what the sovereign Lord says. From the north I am going to bring against Tyre Nebuchadnezzar. He names him, right? King of Babylon, king of kings, with horses and chariots, with horsemen and a great army. History, this is history now. You can go on Wikipedia and find this, right? In 586 BC, Nebuchadnezzar besieged Tyre and he did it for 13 years. Therefore, this is verse 3, therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says, I am against you, Tyre, and I will bring many nations against you like the sea casting, casting up its waves. History records, Alexander the Great comes, comes against Tyre in 332 BC, um, and, it's, and he attacks, what he had done was he had already conquered many nations, and so he had, I can't remember what the number was, but say the armies of 15 nations when he came against Tyre. So it was many nations from all of these places that he had already conquered. Then listen to this. It says, they will destroy the walls of Tyre and pull down her towers. I will scrape away her rubble and make her a bare rock. And history records that both Nebuchadnezzar and Alexander carried this out. And watch, how, watch the next prophecy and how Alexander carried it out. Out of the sea she will become, oh, I forgot to tell you this, Tyre is a, is a coastal nation, right? So it is, it is right on the coast. And if you read scripture about Tyre, you would see they're always talking about ships. They have a lot of uh, flotilla uh, um, boats and stuff. So, but about a half a mile out, there's a big island, all right? And so when Nebuchadnezzar came against Tyre in order to survive, a bunch of them got in their boats, went to the big island, and rebuilt a city on this island. Okay? Now here's what happens. It says, out of the sea, a place, it will become a, a place to spread fishing nets, for I have spoken, declares the Lord, she will become plunder for the many nations. Tyre today is known as a fishing village. That's what it looks like now. So this is exactly what the Bible predicted. But listen to this one. They will plunder your wealth, and loot your merchandise. They will break down your walls and demolish your fine houses and throw your stones and timber and rubble into the sea. I will put an end to your, your noisy songs and the music of your harps will be heard no more. I will make you a bare rock and you will become a place where, this is again where they spread their nets, right? History records that Alexander the Great got there, right? But he had no ships. And he knew that these people were, were on the island, right? And so what, this is history again. This is not Bible. Alexander the Great took all of the rubble from the city, made a causeway. He threw it in the ocean and made a causeway to get to the, um, the city that was on the island. So he did exactly what the Bible said. He took the rubble and he put it in the ocean. Come on now. How do you have somebody who wrote years and years before all of this stuff happens, who says that this is stuff going to happen, and then in history, the exact thing happens. All Alexander would have had to do to make this not happen is say, hey, you know what? I have read what these guys say I'm going to do. I'm not going to put anything in the ocean, and therefore this book will be wrong. It's, it's phenomenal. And then, so this is how it, this is how it works. So he, he built a causeway to get to him. And then, Cyrus, this, is, this, is, this blurs my mind too. Cyrus, the king of Prophet, um, Persia, Isaiah was writing approximately 700 to 680 B.C., um, and he predicted that Babylon, a nation that at the time was barely coming into its end. So Babylon is, is a nation, but it's a fledgling nation. It's a small, tiny nation with actually no power at this time, right? Now, Alexander, I'm sorry, Isaiah says... Would, he would, that Babylon would rise up and it would take the Jews into captivity. He went on to say that um, the Persians would conquer Babylon, again, a nation that was barely in existence. Isaiah also prophesied that the king of Persia would allow the Jews to return to Jerusalem. He also gave the name of the king Cyrus. Now, Isaiah is writing 100 to 150 years before all of this happens. Now, imagine... Somebody came to you and said, I want you to tell me who the president is going to be 150 years from now. What would you say? Now, just like that woman who I said spoke about Diana, he puts a name in it. 
Like, it's specific. It says, King Cyrus, who wasn't the king at that time, because and, and, and these nations are really tiny. He says that, first of all, Babylon will come against the Jews. History records that Cyrus ruled Persia in 559. So you see where he was writing, 700 to 680. In 559 to 530, he conquered Babylon. This is the king of Persia in 539 B.C. And in 538 B.C., he issued a decree to have the Jews return to their land. It's specific. It's specific. Like if this didn't happen, we could come back to the Bible and go, what are you talking about? It is specific, but also if you go to Wikipedia again and read what happened in history, you will see that it was carried out exactly as God said. The predictions of Daniel. Daniel predicted the rise of many empires, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, Babylon, and we're not going to go through those, but they were so specific as well. Now, this one blows my mind. Messianic prophecies. Next week, we're going to learn a bit, a little bit about the Old Testament and how we know that these guys were writing long before Jesus ever came, okay? So these are prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament. There are approximately 60, 60 specific prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament, okay? Now, let's look at probability. The probability that you will die eventually is one to one, okay? Everybody understands that? Okay. The probability that you'll be struck by lightning is one in 700,000. The probability that a meteorite landing on your home is one in whatever that number is. <laughs> right? Okay? So maybe based on this probability, you want to go home and build something over your house that can withstand a meteorite coming to your roof. You won't do that because the probability of that is so small, and we've never even heard about it before, right? Now, so 61 specific prophecies regarding Jesus, written over a period of a thousand years, again, by a lot of men who'd never met each other. The probability of eight messianic prophecies, this, is a guy, this guy was named, his name, Dr. Peter Sterner, and he did, this experiment, he did this thing with a bunch of students and stuff, and Eight Messianic prophecies. Here's what he looked at. That he would be born in Bethlehem, that John the Baptist would be his forerunner, that he would enter Jerusalem riding a donkey, that he'd be, he would be betrayed by a friend, that he would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, that he, he would, the silver would be used to buy a potter's field, that he would keep silent during his trial, and that he would be crucified. So there's really eight. It's just approximately 60. So the probability of those eight Messianic prophecies carried out in one man is that. And here's how the doctor who did this described it. You would have to take silver dollars and pile them 120 feet high over the entire landmass, not the ocean now, the landmass of the world, right? Mark one of them, and then this is, how he, this is how he describes it too. Blindfold a dude, and then have him find that one the first time. That's the probability of eight of these things coming true. There are 60. Do you know what the probability of all 60 of them coming true in one man is? It ain't none. Because it, it, it just can't happen. But Jesus Christ fulfilled prophecies that were written by men who never met him. Years before he came, he fulfilled every single one of them. And the cool thing about it is, we don't just have that he fulfilled some of all of them in scripture, there are writings outside of scripture that tell us that he fulfilled some of them, like his, his crucifixion. And, and come next week, I'm telling you, because the history and archaeology piece is just, it's just so exciting. All right? So this is the probability of those prophecies coming true. So either God did it, or these are just the luckiest fathers you've ever known in your life. Finally, the uniqueness of Jesus. I said earlier that I think we get so used to Jesus 
that we don't understand how unique and how beautiful he is. That we don't understand that this had to come from the mind of a God who loves us so much, from the mind of a God who has so much compassion on his creation. So the first thing, the uniqueness as Jesus Christ as Savior. Luke says this, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be the sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes, lying in a swaddling manger. Do you know how unique Jesus Christ as Savior is when you think about the landscape of all religions? Here's what the Bible says. Like, this doesn't make any sense to me. All right, let's say Marshall and Rashika. Well, not, not, let me back up. Marshall and Rashika are very good friends. I was going to say, let's say they are, which would be ignoring the truth. Let's say Marshall and Rashika. No, Marshall and Rashika are very good friends, right? So they love each other, you know, they, they share things. But then one day, I'm sorry, I can't have my wife be the villain. All right, then one day, <laughs> so one day my wife shares a secret with, with Rashika, and she says, um, you know, the only person that I want to know about this is you because of how close we are and how much I love you, and blah, 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 blah. So then Marshall comes to church on Sunday, and all of you are looking at her strange. Okay, look at her strange. And then she's like, what's going on? And then she finds out that the thing that she told Rashika, all of you know about. Right? Now, in that instance, who's supposed to make it right? Rashika's supposed to come to Marshall and apologize. What if Marshall, after finding out that all of you knew, and her heart was broken, but she went to Rashika and said, I love you, I want to make this right. You know what all of us would think? Kevin, you're crazy. She hurt you and you're telling her. And, and suppose Marshall even said this, what can I do to make this right, to save this relationship? What can I do? We would all go, what is wrong with her? <clears throat> Matter of fact, the first thing that comes up in humankind is, what can I do to get her back? But this is the mind of God. This is how unique the mind of God is. We did everything to separate ourselves from him, and then he did everything to reconcile us back to him. How unique is that? How unique is it that the victim, and, and this is one thing about us, when we are victims, we're never completely innocent, but a victim who was completely innocent and had done nothing but demonstrate love then says, I need to do whatever I can to make it right. And then he doesn't just do anything. He sends his very best, his son, Jesus Christ, and he doesn't just let him do a small thing. He lets him be subject to his creation, the very people who were the reason for the sacrifice in the first place. Jesus said to him, you would have no power over me unless it came from my father. So the power to do what they did to Jesus came from God because he knew that Jesus had to do what he did in order to be our Savior. And he doesn't just allow him to go through anything. He allows him to go through death, and not just any type of death. It wasn't like a, you know, one where you fall asleep and, and, you, and you die in your sleep, or it wasn't even as pleasant as a gunshot which might hit you and you die instantly and you don't feel anything. Jesus was tortured, beaten, brutalized. Why? Because we had done things wrong. How unique is this? How unique is it that God says, <clears throat> I will save you from your sin and yourself, but I will do it in a way which doesn't even require you to do anything to demonstrate your recompense to me but the only thing you have to do is accept my son as, Jesus, as personal savior because everything that was required before the, because of the justice of God, he did. 
Do you know how unique that is, church? Do you know how unique that is, church? That didn't come from the mind of a man. No man thought this up. This came from the mind of God. Every other religious system makes sense to my mind. I remember talking to my brother, who was a Jehovah's Witness at the time, about how they're reconciled to God. And basically, they can't know if they're reconciled to God. Only 144,000 of them. Uh, I won't get into all of that. But only 144,000 of them can know, but the rest of them can't, and they only find out later. But our God says, I write these things so that you will know that you are my children. And the reason that you know is because of what Jesus has done. Like, I know I'm a part of his family, but what did I do to deserve it? Nothing. Jesus did it. Like, this is awesome. Jesus did it. You have to understand. Don't ever get used to, to, to what Jesus has done. Don't ever get so familiar with it that it just feels like normal. It's not normal. This is not how we behave. This is how God behaves. And it blurs my mind to me that people can look at what he has done with disdain. Secondly, the uniqueness as, of Christ as sacrifice. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. So listen. The Bible says that a sacrifice was required in order for us, for our sins to be forgiven. Now, I don't know about you, but if all of you had wronged me, I would have to come up with a sacrifice that it somehow involved your sweat, your toil, your labor, right? It would have to be you who sacrificed something. God says, my word, how do we get used to this? How do we get used to this? God says, there's a sacrifice required because of my justice. But the sacrifice, listen to this now, this blows my mind, is not going to hurt you. It's going to hurt me, God the Father, because he had to watch his son go through what he went through. And it's also going to hurt directly my son. So the sacrifice didn't cause us any pain didn't cause us any sweat, any toil, any labor. All of that was heaped on Jesus. He was our sacrifice. He hung on a cross and sacrificed his life for, and, 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 and listen, while he was on the cross being despised by everybody around him, they were casting nuts, they were teasing him, they were joking. The sacrifice looks amongst that crowd and says, Father, forgive them. How do we get used to this? How do I get used to this? How do I not understand how unique this is, how this separates the Bible and Christian salvation from everything? It's nothing else like it. Every other religious system that I have ever studied, it's all about you. You work your way to God. They all unite in their, that theme. And God comes along and blurs it up to the point where sometimes when you explain this to people, it doesn't make sense to them. You try to talk to them about Jesus, and what do they say? Oh, I got to clean myself up. I got to get myself right. You know why? Because that's what makes sense to them. It doesn't make sense that the most significant gift that they would ever get is free. It, it just doesn't make no sense. Imagine, imagine if Brian Swan was going to university, right? And they got to university and they said to him, listen, Brian, is your father, what's your father's name? You don't know your father's name? Clarence? Okay. They say, is your father Clarence? And Brian says, yes. I said, oh, my word, Clarence was the best student we ever had. Like, he was awesome. What is it you want to be? You, I want to be a, 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 a lawyer. Well, listen, based on what Clarence did, here's your degree. You don't have to do anything, but based on what your father has done, here's your degree. That doesn't make no sense to us because he didn't earn it, right? Our mind says 
Anything that is valuable, I need to be the ones who earn it. And this is sometimes how our flesh gets in the way of us living out our Christian life because our flesh wants to make our salvation and our life about us. And it's one of the things that we have to do with regard to our salvation and even as we live out our Christian life is get ourselves out of the way because the things that Jesus do does for us, we can't do for ourselves. We can't be a sacrifice. And that's the sad thing. This is why we have to tell people the truth because there are people out there trying to be their sacrifice that reconciles them to God. And if we leave them in that state and say, I'm not going to tell you the truth because it's exclusive, we are letting them live our lie, which will lead them to an eternity apart from God. This is so unique. Christ as sacrifice, all the pain, all of the suffering that was required to reconcile us back was done by the only innocent party. It's so unique. This book is so unique. The salvation that it offers is so unique. The uniqueness is Christ, a servant. This makes no sense. Jesus called them all together. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. And their high officials exercise authority over them, not so you. Instead, whoever wants to become the greatest among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. Our musicians can come now. This doesn't make sense. Do you know what happens in every other religion? God sits on high, and you try to impress him. So that at the end of your life, you can spend eternity with him. This one tells me that royalty came, and royalty did not come to be served, but to serve. This is exactly why people kind of liked Princess Diana. Do you remember when she was living? Right? She would find herself in minefields, walking through minefields with children who had been blown up in them, with a risk that she could be blown up herself. And you know what people loved about her? She was royalty, but she came down to come in man. And she lived among them, uh, and she felt what they felt. And, and so royalty is not supposed to do that. I don't think the queen liked it very much, because, and I don't think a lot of the royal family liked it, because for them, that's not what royalty does. Royalty sits behind palace gates, and every now and then goes on a balcony and waves to people. But you don't go and live among them. That's not what royalty does. You certainly don't serve them because I'm royalty. I'm supposed to be served. Do you know how unique this is that God would serve people? And then finally, uniqueness is, uh, the uniqueness of Christ, salvation. In Acts, it says this, Jesus is the stone that the bills rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no one other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Jesus is so unique, people. And what we're talking about today is a revelation given to us by God. And what I'm hoping over the next two weeks is we would go away with such a confidence that this is the word of God, that we would approach how we read it and how we live it much differently. Right? Now here's how I want to encourage you. And the worship team can come now as well. Here's how I want to encourage you. There is coming a time where this debate will be over. Here's what the Bible says. It says, Jesus, who being very nature God, did not consider the equality of God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and becoming obedient even to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every, every, even the skeptics today, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and I don't know where this place is, but under the earth too. And every tongue will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. And then listen, here's what you need to know about defending your faith, right? The last line says, to the glory of God the Father, not to you. This thing about you being right. This is about glory to God. So there's coming a time where every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And let me tell you something. Just like every prediction in the Bible, this one is going to come true as well. 
So here's what we need to do. Take this book. Understand what we have. Understand how unique it is and get into it like we have never done before so that it can influence our lives like it has never done before so that we can live it out like we've never done before because it is the living Word of God. Father, thank you for your Word. Thank you, God, that it is true, it is infallible, and I thank you, God, that we can rely on it. Move in our hearts, God, to the point where we believe it is your word, where we have no doubt in our minds that it is your word. And help us never to be ashamed of your word, even though there are people out there who will ask us questions, who will say things like, how in the world could you let a book that's 2,000 years old tell you how to live? Somebody said that to me recently. Somebody asked me that question recently, and here's what I said to them. The Bible says that we should treat others the way we want to be treated. That's a 2,000-year-old principle. It was written in the book a long time ago. Is it still true today? Yes, it is. The reason I let it still influence my life is because the principles in it are as true today as the day that it was written. Help us, God, to see that and then to live it out in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. And let's worship God. This message has been brought to you by Cornerstone Bible Fellowship Bermuda. To connect with us, visit us at www.cornerstone.bm or if you have a prayer request, email us at prayer at cornerstone.bm.